Hello everyone, Mike Levin, Saturday, June 5th, 2022. Mike Rako asks, how do I learn Linux? Where do I go to learn Linux? Mike Levin answers here. And while I pack my car for my trip to public storage, I will answer your questions. And in the first step of answering that question, I go to uh, this page that I Googled up. First, I, I go to a video app. Let me go to video uh, and show you that my camera had a battery running low. So I brought out uh, this thing and I have the, the power going to it over here. It's going in and that thing is going to a um, an extension cord that I use for uh, electric power tools in the yard. And so I just strung things together and I took the power out from the outlet in my house. I put it to the power in a, to an extension cord and then I uh, took the power out of the extension cord and I piped it to the power in of uh, this device here. And I took the power out of that device here and I piped it into this iPhone charging cable. And then the power out of the iPhone charging cable into the iPhone itself. So I have piped the output to the input to the output to the input to the output to the input until I have the final result I needed, which was my iPhone able to be here on this improvised uh, camera stand with these hair bands holding it on there. So, you know, paper clip and uh, bubble gum and toothpicks, right? A little bit MacGyver here. So that's the first thing I tell you. And then the second thing is I go into this article and give you just a little bit of history. This is part of learning uh, Linux, because to learn Linux, you have to learn where Linux came from. It's copying Unix, so you need to know where Unix came from, and Unix came from a desperation of avoiding a dystopian future that was inadvertently created by Fernando L. Corbato. I have a little bit difficulty reading uh, backwards. Modern cloud technologies allow any user to get unlimited access to huge computing power from anywhere in the world. Sounds like a new thing, right? That's very 2010s, 2020s, the advent of the cloud. However, the core principle of this concept was developed in the late 1950s, not the 60s, my friend, the 50s, decades before the emergence of concepts such as cybersecurity and cloud. Its pioneer was not a large technology company like IBM, but an ambitious young scientist with Spanish roots. Now it's customary to call him the father of the computer password, but Corbato's merits did not end there. Computation Q. Back in the 1950s, the young scientist Fernando Corby Corbato earned his PhD in physics from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. As a doctor of sciences, he was admitted to computing on one of the most powerful and promising computers of that time, Whirlwind. After some time, having figured out the principle of the computer, Corbato was delighted. This device could do much more interesting things than the banal solution of physical problems one after another. But the physicist did not have time for a detailed study of the capabilities of the computer. The fact that the computer was shared by several MIT facilities at once, no. No one wanted to give up legal time to the young doctor's dubious projects. No one wanted to share time. Greed gave rise to multics. At best, Corbato could be content with 30 minutes of computer work a day. And in the early hours of the morning, I had to reluctantly get up early and experiment for a few minutes until colleagues with serious faces and calculations came. This is the spirit by which the precursor to Unix was created. I'm not even talking about Unix from which Linux was copied. 
I'm talking about Multics from which Unix was copied, 1950s, the halls of MIT. A young Spanish professor, scientist type who couldn't get the computer time he wanted because of serious types. Probably this story left a serious imprint on the entire future career of Fernando Corbato. In the very early 1960s, he developed the first time-sharing operating system. It allowed several people to use the computer at the same time. In other words, the problem of queuing for machine time had disappeared, waiting in line for computer use. No one had to wait in line. You could all be on the computer at the same time. Fernando Corbato. Multics, 1960s. <sighs> the principles laid down by Corbato are still reflected in the operating system of modern electronic devices. So I could go on, okay? But that gives you the background to understand that there was this thing called Multics that was developed at MIT by Fernando Corbato. And in the coming years, its value was recognized by AT&T Bell Labs, Honeywell Corporation, General Electric, who gathered together and said, let's make a commercial product out of this. And you know what you have when you take a time-sharing computer and you put it into the hands of public profit incented companies? Cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. You've got a cash register. Every compute cycle, every second, every time you sit down, you're paying, you're paying, you're paying, you're paying. Ye old cloud, ye old cloud. Meanwhile, the story uh, fast forwards to the halls of Bell Labs. There's some famous names for this place. I got to get down these nicknames, but it really is um, known as being where Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, the legendary two, who saw this consortium of dystopian future knitters, right? They're knitting together a dystopian future by which all computing would be in the hands of large cap corporations who not only knew everything you were doing on your computer, because it wasn't running on your computer, it was running on their computer, and they were going to charge you for every clock cycle that you ran your code on their computers. This made Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie very nervous. And I'll start packing the car because this is where your education of Linux starts. It's in a rogue. What are the names for these people? Um, Ronin, a Ronin, an independent samurai. He was working. He was very hard to recruit. But finally, you know, AT&T, Bell Labs back in those days, got this young, brilliant Ken Thompson to go to work for them. It was not easy. They had to literally hunt him down. And, but they brought him in. So when you have a maverick like this, you know, doing their own thing, and you have this large dystopian sci-fi future coming down on you like an, like an anvil dropping on the head of the coyote, a wily e. coyote, Ken Thompson goes, wait a minute, Multex is fine. We, we love Fernando Corbato. We love all that stuff. It's good stuff. What we don't like is this, you know, commercial corruption of these good time sharing things. So what if you just don't share time quite as much? What if instead of running on big centralized computers, you run it on these smaller lightweight computers like those from Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, which were starting to trickle out at this time into Bell Labs and universities and colleges. And in the form of the PDPs, PDP-6 was I think one of the early ones where they started playing around with this stuff. And then later, the very famous PDP-11, right? The PDP-11 is the one where all this stuff culminated. But Ken, Rich Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie said, what if we make an operating system for these things that takes the best part of Multics and just chops some of it off? We'll call it, I don't know, it's more for one person than multi-people. So Multics is for multi-users and we're chopping something off. I don't, Uni, Uni just Unix? We'll call it Unix. Yeah. yeah, let's call it Unix. And there begins the long, long, long legacy of 
extremely geeky and often in poor taste and involving male genit genitalia, jokes of Unix and subsequently Linux. This is your education. All right, you getting this, Michael? So I'll start packing and you ponder that for a moment while I, I get my next part of the lesson ready. It's been 10 minutes. That's a lot in 10 minutes. Whew, okay. This is glass and it got, has to go into here and I'll make it part of the lesson. I had to wheel this over a lot of stuff. So first of all, I use these, these very easy to use straps that I use for my canoe to tie down my canoe and to keep it from uh, rolling off the top of the car. <laughs> but they're very easy to connect. They're these easy quick connects. It can be used in a lot of different ways, these easy quick connects. It's protecting the user a little bit with this rubber, but you push that in, you push that in like that, 